This episode of The Minimalist is brought to you by nobody, because advertisements suck. The Minimalists. <laughs> Hello, simpletons. Welcome to The Minimalist Podcast, where we discuss what it means to live a meaningful life with less. My name is Joshua Fields Milburn. And I'm Ryan Nicodemus, and together we are The Minimalists. Today, we're going to talk about the high price of materialism. Mm. You know, Ryan, this Friday is Black Friday. It is. Yes. I mean, when this episode comes out, <laughs> oh, it is. okay. <laughs> I mean, I guess with the right attitude, any Friday can be Black Friday. Well, I think some, what's fascinating is, is it is changing this year because everything has changed and been turned upside down. Oh, if, there, yeah. if there's one, one good thing to, uh, to come out of this whole pandemic, I thought it was going to be everyone became united all of a sudden. Mm. That didn't happen. Mm. Uh, but some people did. And we talked to Rob Bell about that a few months ago. But I think that you know, one thing that we're noticing is a lot of retail stores are closing on Thanksgiving Day. Yeah. Um, we're probably not going to see wild doorbuster sales. I would imagine not. I mean, there may be some places that do this that are trying to be countercultural or, or whatever, yeah. um, which would be weird because consumerism is not countercultural. It, it is the culture, really. Oh, when, right. When you think yeah. about it, we're in a consumer culture, Yeah. a materialist culture mm. you know in our first film minimalism uh, Juliet Shore talked about maybe the problem is actually we're not materialist enough yeah like we we don't value the the right things because we opt instead for just anything yeah oh you could tweet that podcast I, Sean yeah I love the uh I love how she talks about materialism because every time I hear that it sounds like a pejorative to me but because we don't care about our stuff we're actually not very materialistic Right. And, yeah. and when we treat everything as disposable. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying cling on to everything. No. What I'm saying is get rid of the excess. And that's what this whole minimalist message is about. But then when we're we're bringing things in, we're doing so in a sort of uh, you. I heard this term recently. I think it's a word that's been it's coming to vogue recently. Uh, we're, we're creatives. Right. But I heard this term curatives. And I think as as minimalists, often that's what we are. We are curatives. We want to we don't want to shun stuff. We want to shun the inappropriate stuff. Yeah. And what is appropriate for you may not be appropriate for me and vice versa. I've got this book here, Ryan. I wanted to read an ex excerpt to start the podcast today. This is called The High Price of Materialism. It's by Professor Tim Kasser. And this is the intro to the book. We're going to dive more into this later during the Maximal episode. I've got some great stuff to cover with you. But I just wanted to kick off this conversation before we get into our audience questions with this excerpt cool the first chapter is called mixed messages there's a quote at the beginning it's six lines chase after money and security and your heart will never unclench care about people's approval and you will be their prisoner do your work then step back the only path to serenity Five centuries ago, the Chinese philosopher Lao Tzu penned these six lines warning people of the dangers of materialistic values that's 2,500 years ago. It's unbelievable. Yeah, and we're still tackling it today. And in fact, um, that's what this book goes into. Sages from almost every religious uh, and f philosophical background have similarly insisted that focusing on attaining material possessions and social renown detracts from what is meaningful about life. Although we, although we may not nod our head, although we may nod our heads in recognition of this ancient wisdom, such advice is largely drowned out by today's consumeristic hubbub of messages proclaiming that material pursuits, accumulation of things, and the presentation of quote the right image provide real worth, deep satisfactions, and a genuinely meaningful life. Newspaper headlines exalt the local lottery winner. Get rich quick books climb the, to the top of bestseller lists. Multicolor ads flash on web pages. Celebrities on television hawk everything from sport utility vehicles to mascara. Although they differ in form, each of these messages essentially proclaims that happiness can be found at the mall, on the internet, or in the catalog. Both types of messages about the value of materialism coexist in contemporary life and they can be difficult to know whether to follow the sages or the celebrities. Who is right? Will the pursuit of money and possessions bring about the good life or the promises of consumer society false? I mean, obviously, 
I think people know where we stand on this continuum. Yeah. But at the same time, we're not professing to be people who live without or deprive ourselves yeah. in perpetuity. Yeah, you know, it's funny. In the new documentary we have coming out, there's like a scene of me in my apartment. You know, oh, like, less is now. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> it, is it? <laughs> Uh, yeah, uh, in our documentary, Less Is Now, that will be coming out soonish. Yeah, January um, 1st. There is a scene in the beginning of me in my apartment, trying to get back on track here, uh, where it shows like my TV and like some books and stuff. And I was like, oh man, like I'm going to get criticized for like, oh, you have a TV and you have books. And I almost asked Matt to cut out the TV, mm -hmm. but I'm like, no, dude. Yeah. Like I want people to realize that this isn't an extreme lifestyle. Mm. We're not trying to make people feel bad for the things that they have. We yeah. just we want them to feel good. We want them to be materialistic in the true sense. Right. Um I hope people who don't have a TV, I hope they don't see that and then go out and buy a TV because I have one. <laughs> but but yeah, no, it's just interesting cuz you're absolutely right. Like we're not trying to we're not trying to be aesthetics. We're not trying to show people that Hey, look, you can live with as little as possible. Like, that's not the message. Right. I do want you to be unhappy if you are unhappy, meaning I want you to recognize that you're unhappy or discontented by the status quo that you've created. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by that is if you've reached a point where there is dissatisfaction in your life, don't cover it up with more stuff. Mm -hmm. Right. Acknowledge the fact and sit with that for a moment and say, wow, yeah, I've done some things. You, know, mm -hmm. you and I, especially in our late 20s, we reached this, this tipping point by the time we were 30 years old where it was like, wow. We've, we've pursued this path the uh, of materialism, of you know, all, all of the, the supposedly nice things that are going to make us, as, as Professor Kessler says here, he said, um, happiness can be found at the mall, on the internet, or in the catalog. At least that was my hypothesis, and yeah. I was proved wrong. Hmm. Now, that, I, I will say this, you know, I'm not allergic to money, and, no. and I think people often conflate money and things. Uh, I think the pursuit of money alone is probably not a, a noble or worthwhile goal. No. But I think we all need some stuff. There was a quote on the second page here from the uh, writer, or from the poet, Robert Graves. He said, there is no poetry in money. Mm. And when I, when I hear something like that, what I, what I hear is that like all, all of life's beauty, all of life's mystery, all of life's excitement and joy is captured outside of money. However, we do need money to pay our bills, to uh, to have a certain amount of security in, in our lives. Yeah. And that's different for each of us. And I know that when I left the corporate world, I made about 90% less than I made in the corporate world, but yeah. was strangely more financially secure. Mm -hmm. Because for the first time in my life, I took control of the, the bills that I had and got rid of the vast majority of them, virtually all of them, and lived off of $23,000 a year. Mm -hmm. But I, not only was I happier, I was... I was more secure. So money also doesn't buy you security. I found that money is an amplifier. And I don't think the same thing about material possessions necessarily. Hmm. So hear me out. Uh, money, if you have really bad habits, man, it, it, it's going to take you down the, it's going to accelerate that bad path really quickly. How many lottery winners have we heard of that just go off the deep end very quickly. Yeah. Almost all of them. Mm -hmm. There's a, some exceptions. There may be someone who has already good habits and they happen to win the lottery. And now they're, mm. they're set. They can contribute beyond themselves more because it will amplify those good habits. If you're a generous person and all of a sudden you win the lottery, wow, you're probably going to be generous with that I money. I told you about the people who won the lottery in Lebanon, Ohio, right? No, tell like, me. So, so my ex-father-in-law was president of a bank mm. in Lebanon. You'll never guess what bank. Anyway, <laughs> uh, he told me that during his presidency, five people won the lottery. Four of them went bankrupt. And he said the other one that... The other one that didn't go bankrupt, what they did is they lived their life like they had never won the lottery. Right. <laughs> they didn't change a thing. They right. They set a bunch of money in their bank account. Right. Yeah. And and so they had a, a bigger safety net, so to speak. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. And and I think the opposite is true with our possessions. Whereas if you have good habits, mm -hmm. 
you don't need more. St- if the more stuff you have, it can actually get in the way of those good habits. Yeah, I, I think money won't necessarily get in the way of your good habits, and and I think that's that's the difference here. Mm, I, by yeah. the way, I don't think I'm allergic to stuff either. Mm-hmm. I am. I, I do have this particular allergy to excess, mm-hmm. and. And that's what I really want to talk about today. I think some of our questions are geared around that. But I wanted, before we get into those questions, Ryan, there were a few things that really stood out here. Yeah. We, uh, real quick, though, expound on you said that money is an amplifier. Right. But stuff cannot be an amplifier. Right. So, okay. So, so what I mean by that is, is I, I think that, you know, so if you're making really bad habits, if you get more stuff, it's just, it's a pacifier. It's going to, yeah, you'll continue to make bad habits. But if you, are making really good good decisions. You have really good habits in, in your life. Oh, okay. Yeah. You get a whole bunch of stuff. I see it in that it's, context. It's actually, yeah. it's actually probably going to get in the way of your good habits. I see what you're saying. Yeah. I understand that context. It's going to, here's a better way to look at it. Hmm. Our stuff is distracting. Yeah. It's shiny and, and you know, the, the, all of these sort of analogies of bells and whistles and, and, and dist- it, it's, it's everything. Once we get everything, we're, we're distracted by everything. I remember mm-hmm. when you did your packing party, mm-hmm. it, it was, you were finally like your house was no longer distracting. Right. Now that's jarring at first when you remove those pacifiers, those, yeah. those distractions. But w- when you start to deal with that, you realize like, oh, I've been filling the void, but if you fill the void with stuff, it only widens the void. You talk about the pursuit of money, and I totally agree. Like that, there's no joy, there's no poetry in the pursuit of money. But you know, instead of the pursuit of money, maybe people should look at the pursuit of well-being. Mm-hmm. And during that pursuit, there are things. There are there are, there is money that is going to help you on that pursuit. Sure. Yeah, but yes, they're like you said, like they are, they are uh, amplifiers or they're uh, tools. We we talk about that a lot too. It's it's a tool rather than than the end, than the end game essentially. I've got a few more things uh, on, uh, sort of in that in that vein here. There was a study done at the at Montana State University in Bozeman. I think it's on page sixty three of this book. The Montana State University. <laughs> <laughs> what is this, Ohio? <laughs> Um, oh, here it is right here. So yeah, uh, students who strongly focused on the pursuit of wealth, fame, and image reported lower quality relationships with friends and lovers. Mm. That is, materialistic values were associated with shorter, less positive, and more negative relationships than non-materialistic values. Other studies find that materialistic individuals experience more alienation in their social relationships than non-materialistic people. And then it goes on to say, students highly focused on financial success were likely to feel estranged from their culture. Yeah. And I think that was maybe one of the things that happened to the, those four lottery winners. All of a sudden, they they felt like outsiders, right? Because everyone starts treating them differently, wanting yeah. things from them, etc. And or the other side is if if you're pursuing something the rest of your culture isn't uh, or the rest of the people around you aren't pursuing, then it's going to be at odds yeah. with um with the life that they're living. And so you're going to feel like an outsider if if you're pursuing that. And then, of course, what do we do? I know I felt that way in my 20s. So what did I do? Well, I'll just get more stuff because eventually, or more status, right? Eventually, I'll be like the people I want to be like. And then maybe they'll accept me and I'll get to be with them. But no, they were just as lonely and as isolated as me. It was like, it was like going to some place in the middle of the ocean where you have all these tiny little individual islands. Like, mm. I've got my own island, but I'm on my own island. Yeah. So I was um, driving down Rodeo Drive recently as an anthropology experiment. Yeah. And you know, people were wearing masks outside. It's a Saturday. And Bex and I got out and we just started walking to, to look to see what was going on. And it was really fascinating to me because there are people just on Saturday morning They are lined up outside of these really expensive stores where you can buy a Louis Vuitton face mask for $1,200. What? Can you imagine? Um, Yeah, wow. Talk about virtue signaling. (laughs) (laughs) Right. But I think we all do that. I mean, that's an extreme example. That's that's maybe the terminus. But but 
is it that different from the Nike symbols I've seen on a on a face mask? It's essentially doing the same thing. It's it's just doing so amplified, right? Yeah. And what we're trying to because a Nike swoosh on your face mask or you on on a piece of clothing even doesn't improve the piece of clothing in any way if it did if it made you breathe better or jump higher or whatever Mm -hmm. great so be it but it doesn't do that what it does is is it signals i'm this type of person to to other people but i think what it actually does Hmm. is it gets it, it it gets people to advertise on behalf of an of a corporation for free in yeah. fact not even for free it's you paying louis vuitton twelve hundred dollars for the privilege of advertising their products yeah. their logo mm. and and so it's it's this very it's, it's this strange dynamic and i noticed this that you know there are a lot of people waiting out there they were mostly younger and what this book talks about uh, the high price of materialism is that you know you and i grew up really poor mm-hmm. and poor people tend to make decisions with their money that are very sort of immediate Mm -hmm. not thinking about the future and i can tell you from from the first 18 years of my life those habits were established and i spent the next 12 years of my life finally making some money but those habits continued throughout my my late teens and all throughout my 20s until i was about 30 Mm. and and that that way of living is i even though i was making good money i had the habits of my poor young self Mm. let's spin this as soon as we get it let's live paycheck to paycheck yeah let's not consider the future or let's spend it before we get it yeah well that's (laughs) even worse right in fact on the maximal episode i do want to talk to you about the history of consumerism Mm. i want to see is it 2500 years old is it 5000 years old or maybe it's about 10 to 12000 years old mm-hmm. and i've got some some philosophies a- around that before we before we get into these questions though this book talked about how celebrities and influencers are are really part of the problem i was uh, having a conversation with uh, Sheila from habits of waste on, on this podcast and she talked about how one of the worst things that's happened to the plastic industry is when people like Jennifer Aniston started advertising for bottled water. Mm. And and we don't realize how, you know, the we are so triggered, but I really like this person and so I'm going to now purchase this product they recommend because it's going to make me similar to them. It's going to make me Jennifer Aniston or it's going to make me Kylie Jenner or it's going to make me LeBron James or or, or whomever. Mm-hmm. And it's almost as though we need some actual celebrities to 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 take on a more intentional message of mm. not consuming, of advertisements suck. Now, I think there are some that have done it really well. Yeah, you can't imagine Kurt Cobain ever being in a Pepsi ad, right? Or Radiohead ever being used in a Gap commercial, right? Uh, and, and so there are there are some, but how can they take an active stance uh, against it? How do we have the thing I talked to Sheila about is how do we get Brad Pitt to advertise for tap water? Yeah. The tap water I'm drinking right now because that's much more powerful than Joshua Fields Milburn recommending tap water. Right. But if, if he's doing it, you're like, well, we have to start drinking yeah. tap water. It's Brad Pitt. It's like right now we've got like a 10 to 1 ratio for every 10 celebrities that are advertising bottled water or whatever product. Mm-hmm. You've got one who's trying to do the right thing. So, yeah, the question is, is like how do you reverse – how do you make that a one to ten ratio? What's the Upton Sinclair quote when he yeah. says, "You know, you, you can't change a man's mind when his income depends on him not changing his mind." Right. Yeah. And I think that's one of the biggest problems with advertising. Let's dive more into that on the maximal. We got some questions here from Michelle in Phoenix, Arizona, to start. How do I get started? How do I continue decluttering and cleaning? And I know that it will make my life happier, but how do I get started? My, I have three boys. They have tons of Legos and toys, and they obviously play with everything the moment I try to get it out. So how do you tackle that? How do you teach them to minimize their toys? So, Ryan, I think the easiest thing to do here is if you just start by getting rid of the three boys, I think the toys go with them. Well, yeah, maybe just try to get rid of one of them at first. <laughs> oh, so like a minimalism game, but with getting rid of children. Yeah, that's horrible, man. 
<laughs> I think you and I are the only ones who find that funny. <laughs> yeah, you're probably right. Yeah, but no, so here's the thing: we don't right, want yeah. to yeah, don't get, get rid, rid of your the, kids. the people we love. <laughs> right. And we, in fact, we don't want to exacerbate or agitate the people we love. I think that is is a common thing that happens when couples start decluttering, but only one person is actually doing the the decluttering. Yeah. We need to get the buy-in first. Yeah. Now, where do you get started? Yeah, this is a common question. Why? Well, because the average American household, the average Western household has hundreds of thousands of items in it and we're overwhelmed with stuff we are already you know michelle is exacerbated by her stuff and she's so overwhelmed she doesn't even know where to start how do i start simplifying and so we just throw our hands up now you and i have done a few different things in fact we talk about this in less is now um where our two different approaches mine was like i got rid of one item a day for 30 days just to see if i could do it because anyone can get rid of one thing a day for 30 days. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, that turned into the 30-day minimalism game, which is what I'm going to recommend to Michelle. We have a, a free minimalism game calendar on our website, theminimalists.com slash game. You can download that, and it shows you how many items you're getting rid of. But the way it works is one thing on the first day, two things on the second day, three things on the third day. So by the third day, you've gotten rid of six things. You're getting that momentum, mm -hmm. and it's snowballing. It starts off really easy, but by mid-month, 15 things on day 15, 16, day, uh, 16 items on day 16, so forth, and so on. And, and I think, well, we've seen that work for tens of thousands of people. Mm -hmm. If you want to get a bit more extreme, Ryan did a little thing called a, a packing party. Mm. Yeah, that's, uh, I don't recommend that for most people. I mean, I'm an extreme person. I think maybe it's because I'm so ADD. I, I don't know, man. Like, I really need my attention powerfully refocused yeah or my perspective powerfully refocused and the packing party did that for me i mean yeah i packed up everything i packed up uh everything <laughs> <laughs> literally and i unpacked it as i needed it and it was a great experiment i mean when i was done i had you know 80 percent of my stuff in boxes and it really helped me shift my perspective but you know if the minimalism game doesn't work that's too easy if the packing party is too crazy, mm -hmm. then maybe, uh, you know, somewhere in the middle, you start with like your powder room or something with a packing party. Yeah. Um, but Wait, here, here, here's I, no, your... I had a powder room. <laughs> um, I mean, if you got powder in there, it's technically a powder room. Ah, here, here's, here's what I'd recommend for Michelle too. Uh, Michelle, you've got to start with your family too. And I don't, I don't mean minimize your family, <laughs> but you got to get them on the same page. So even before you do a packing party, before you do the men's game, before you do the one room packing party, Unless it's your own personal room, then maybe you don't have to talk to your kids about it. Right. But, you know, what really stands out in her question to me is how do I get my kids on board? And what you do is you help them find the benefits in simplifying. So with kids, you know what kids love to do? They like to do a couple things. Um, <laughs> it's taking me everything to not be a smart ass right now. Talk Eat about candy. What, right. Exactly. But there are two things that I know kids like to do. One is they love to help. Um, that is what, I mean, I remember when I was a kid, I was always trying to like pump gas for my dad. I was like always trying to like help my mom clean the toilets. Like, and it's funny cause I remember my dad at one point, he's like, Ryan, you're going to hate pumping gas. Just enjoy the time that you don't have to pump the gas. I'm like, no, but I want to pump the gas. Yeah. And, uh, now I guess I don't hate it, but it's still, it's a pain in the ass. But anyway, kids love to help. So, uh, you know, give this as uh, to your kids as an option to help. The other thing too and I guess this kind of goes in line with helping is kids love to help others like donate. Uh, they, 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 they'd like to bring others happiness. So if you can help your kids see that those, those toys that they're giving up, they're being donated to another kid and they're making that other kid happy. Like the, the kid is going to love the fact that they are making someone else happy. So kids love to help. They love to assist and they also like to make other people happy. So find a way to help your kids see those two things and maybe that'll just give them a little bit of of a spark mm -hmm. to help you start but michelle it's easy to get overwhelmed it's easy to throw your hands up in the air and be like i can't do this it's too much my my kids are in the way and all my other stuff is in the way like i get it but you have to start somewhere and uh unfortunately there's no magic bullet answer that we're going to be able to say right now to like help you be like oh yeah i'm gonna declutter tomorrow and it's all gonna be done yeah um the, the the thing that we're josh and i are trying to tell you is start small you gotta start small yeah and and what i think with the, the minimalism game the reason it's gonna work so well for you and your family is it does help 
you get some buy-in with them, especially if there's some sort of outcome you're working toward. So I don't know what the reward is going to be. I don't know what your your specific kids are into, but there could be a family reward. There could be an individual reward as well. Mm-hmm. So if you're playing oh, this yeah. game with your entire family, so each person gets rid of one thing on the first day. It all starts out really easy. And second day, you each get rid of two items. Whoever goes the longest wins. If you all make it to the end of the month, well, you've each gotten rid of about 500 items. It's a phenomenal start. One other thing for your kids, Michelle, Show them what they're making room for. As they're getting rid of the stuff they no longer play with, you know, there a couple rules there, like the 90-90 rule. We call it the seasonality rule in our Minimalist rule book, which uh, I'd love to give you a free copy of, uh, The Minimalist's rule book. You can find it at theminimalists.com slash rule book. And uh, it's a free ebook. You can, anyone can download it for free. Or if you want the audiobook version, that is also available. Ryan and I record an audiobook version. But the rule that stands out in there to me is the one in 10 out rule yeah because you're if they get rid of 10 things maybe they're making room for one new thing that's truly going to add value to their life so i think you'll enjoy that and i think the rules in there will help you set up some boundaries that you need michelle jay in arlington texas has a question for us i was wondering about your opinions of paying for minimalism that is always having to cough up money to reduce ad clutter For example, I have to pay to remove ad clutter from my email reader, my podcast player, and countless other applications and online tools. Are you ever worried that in the future the only way to escape clutter is to pay for it? You see, (laughs) no matter what, you're paying for your clutter. Yeah. Whether it's money, whether it's time, whether it's attention, Mm -hmm. you're paying for your clutter. Yeah. So the question that Jay is asking here is, should I pay money? to not have clutter in my life. Well, the question is, Jay, is what do you have more of? Money, time, or attention? And which one is renewable, which one isn't? Exactly. For me, it's a, it's a no-brainer. I pay for YouTube Premium. It's yeah. like 12 bucks a month, and I, I never, for- ever see an ad there. Me too. Spotify, I pay for the premium. Right, and, and it's because I don't want to pay with my attention mm-hmm. there. It really frustrates me when you sign up for a service and they still do advertisements on the service. Uh, uh, you know, the, the newspapers are certainly this way. Yeah television channel cable tv has commercials on it but you pay for i don't have cable tv personally but like if you pay for cable tv and then they also serve up commercials as well you're paying both and so realize that the true cost of these things it's insidious it's so so much higher than just the money you pay now i get it not all of us can afford to pay for all of these things so there's a third option Mm. What is that third option? It mean it might mean go without. Yeah. It's not like, well, I either want the GQ magazine I'll pay for it, but then I don't want any ads or or you know, I'll take the free version with ads, you know, that's a probably a bad example, but uh you we can go back to YouTube for a second. Or doesn't Hulu that does commercials, doesn't it? So there's like a yeah, so there's like a, a higher tier version there. Yeah. Well, maybe the third option is you you like me, you just don't have Hulu. Right. And you use Sean's password like I do. <laughs> and if yeah. you uh, sign up for a Patreon, we'll give you Sean's password. Right. I was gonna, <laughs> I was gonna say we have a much better answer to this. Uh, you'll just have to pay two dollars to listen to our Patreon <laughs> episode, and we'll give you a much better answer, Jay. So no, just kidding. Here, here's the thing, Jay. You are already paying, and that's yes. that. This is the danger of advertising. They've tricked you into thinking it's free, but if you're not paying for the product then maybe you are the product. Yeah. Boom. Tweet that. All right, Jay. Enjoy this copy of Everything That Remains. I'm going to send you a copy of that book. If you like our podcast, you really like the audio book version of Everything That Remains. It is my favorite book that we've ever written. Ryan was just telling me while we were listening to this question, he has a friend who's on their third time reading it right mm-hmm. now. And... Um, I I get really nice messages about all the time. It's this narrative, this five-year journey of me and Ryan going through the corporate world, deciding to walk away from that world and be a lot more intentional with the fewer resources that we have. It's called Everything That Remains. If you want the audio book, we'll send that to you or the book book or the ebook. We're happy to send those to you as well, Jay. Ryan, what time is it? You know what time it is. It is time for our lightning round where we answer your text messages. Text your questions and comments to area code 937 202 
five four. Yes, indeed. Those texts go to both of our phones, and we personally reply to as many as we can. During the lightning round, this is where Ryan and I do our best to answer every question with a short, shareable, less than 140 character response. We put the text to these minimal maxims in the show notes so you can copy and share our pithy answers on social media. And now you can find all of our minimal maxims in one place, minimalmaxims.com. All right. You want to hear from Linda? Let's do it. What's a good way of controlling stuff you love but don't really have space for? Now, this is fascinating. I actually italicized stuff love. Stuff you love. I know. That's why I read it like that. I know. I, I, <laughs> and so uh, this is we, we have a language problem. And I actually want to argue with Ryan about this on the Maximal episode. We're, we're running out of time. But we had a conversation with Rob Bell a couple months ago during the Maximal. And he goes, I think this is where you and I disagree about the, the, the language problem. And I, I don't know what he meant by that. So um, we're going to tackle that on the Maximal. Maximal, but I'm going to give you my pithy answer I was just here. trying to pick a fight, man. Well, I, let's pick one. I, I brought some <laughs> boxing gloves and some duct tape, a wait shovel. A, wait a minute. It's the only way you'd be able to beat me up. <laughs> <With> duct tape? <laughs> By tying my hands behind my back. Oh. <laughs> All right. So uh, my pithy answer is an oldie but a goodie. Love people and use things because the opposite never works. You're now, such a cheater, man. Now, now, yeah, right. But why am I saying that here? Because... What's a good way of controlling the stuff you love but don't really have space for? Well, stop loving the stuff. I mean, mm -hmm. that's really the thing. My seven-year-old daughter loves her stuff. She's a child. And the problem is I think we start to behave like children. We get confused. And I think language is really powerful. I know you don't really love your things the same way that you love your mother or your children or your sister. I know that. But I think what, we, what happens is we get confused and we start using that same language. When we say... I love you, that means something. When I say my iPhone is sexy, what a weird thing to say, right? We're, we're talking about our technology. This gives me an idea for iPhone cases. <laughs> uh -oh. <laughs> <laughs> There's something there, man. No, we'll talk about it on the maximum. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it, seriously, I, I think it's a language problem. So the, the, what I'm going to start with is let's start talking about the thing because you're saying you love these things, but they're they're getting in your way. You don't enjoy them anymore. Hmm. Well, that should be the purpose of the, of the stuff anyway. It should serve a purpose or bring you joy. And if it's no longer doing that, then let it go. And I think the easiest way to let it go is if you stop loving it. I don't know. It's like what if someone gave – like if someone gave me a horse – I love horses. It's not a thing, though. Yeah, right. But, but uh, I mean, even with a horse, which isn't a thing, mm -hmm. I don't have the time, the attention, and the money mm -hmm. to stable a horse. So the, she, it's, she might as well be asking me, like, hey, I don't have the time, attention, money to stable a horse. Yeah. How do I do that? Right. Uh, if it's causing you discontent, if it's causing you anxiety, then that's a sign that it might be actually toxic, and you may not love it as much as you think. Or even like it as much as you think. That's great. So uh, my pithy answer is there is no such thing as toxic love. Mm. That's solid because here's the thing. You, you're, you're at this point right now where it is has gotten to a, a point where there is a bit of toxicity there. And it may just be a micro dose of toxicity. Mm -hmm. But you and I know that micro dose of toxicity, it's like a little bit of mold, right? Mm -hmm. Over After a, a month a year, a decade, all of a sudden your whole life is taken over and it's really unhealthy for you. Yeah. Love that pithy answer. All right, we got a bunch of listener tips today and some added value, our added value segment. It looks like uh, we got a bunch more surprise questions this week too, like how do I get my wife to get rid of unused junk that's been sitting in our basement forever? How do you combat boredom when you get super minimal? That's my <laughs> favorite superhero, super minimal. Super minimal. How do you respond when your boss tells you to shop for clothes and he encourages materialism? How do we go about finding quality items that bring us value when we're surrounded by a sea of junk? Plus, we have questions about clothes, cars, appliances, the opportunity cost of materialism, minimalist privilege, and a million more questions for The Minimalists. And if you want to hear all that, subscribe to our Maximal episodes on The Minimalist Private Podcast. It's a completely separate podcast, and it's the most honest way for The Minimalists to earn an income because we don't believe in advertisements. By the way, if you're not a private podcast supporter, you're literally missing two-thirds of our show. Just go ahead and try it out for a month or three weeks or whatever. It's just two bucks, and that's not two dollars a day. You're already spending two bucks a day on coffee. Mm -hmm. We're talking two bucks a week. It's mm -hmm. it, And we, what we do is we try to add much, much, much 
much more value than that, those two dollars. So try it out. There's a whole back catalog of over a hundred previous private podcast episodes where we really dive deep with our guests, also individual episodes. Also, we did a bunch of 50 different quarantine conversations with, with different people like Dave Ramsey and Dan Savage and, and uh, Glennon Doyle was wonderful. So a bunch of people over there as well. You can check it all out, theminimalists.com slash support to subscribe. You'll get a personal link so that our private podcast plays in your favorite podcast app. Ryan, what else you got for us this week? Here they are, the comments and tips from our listeners. Check them out. Hey, guys. It's Carly calling from the Gold Coast of Australia. It was really awesome seeing you on your tour stop here. One of the callers asked for resources to do a spirituality that would suit a minimalist, and I wanted to recommend the Tao Te Ching. The Tao Te Ching is an ancient spiritual text, but it's really more of a philosophy than a religion. There are some people, especially in China, though, who do follow it a bit more like a religion. Um, but it's basically an easy read. It's just a set of 81 verses, more like poems. And they're about all different things, but they're all to do with li- living a life of meaning and passion and happiness. And there are many, many verses about living simply and not being materialistic. I don't come across many people who are actually familiar with this book, The Tao Te Ching, but it's actually the number two most printed book in all of history second only to the Bible. Um, And many scholars do consider it the wisest book ever written. So I definitely think anyone that's interested in a spiritual path that has something strongly to do with minimalism, it's definitely worth worth picking up a copy of the Tao Te Ching. Hi, Josh and Ryan. I have been a minimalist since before I even knew there was such a thing as minimalism. Uh, But one area that has really suffered in my minimalism has been my wardrobe. I despise clothes shopping. I hate looking through racks to find something that suits my style. I hate piecing together outfits. I hate trying on clothes in the store. And I often go far too long between shopping sessions because I hate the entire process, the whole experience. So my small wardrobe suffers. But on your episode about clothing, um, I think it was Ryan who mentioned Stitch Fix. So I decided to give them a try. I've received two shipments already, and I absolutely love it. I filled out a style profile online, created a Pinterest board, and the stylist nailed it and has me all set up for our early Arizona summers. Um, I now have a wardrobe that looks intentional and makes me feel good about myself, and I didn't hate making it happen. So I want to thank you so much for this suggestion. Made my day. And real quick for right here, right now, here's one thing that's going on in the life of the minimalists. Well, Ryan, we have... We just talked about it briefly. We have our new documentary coming out on Netflix. Yeah. It's a Netflix original this time. Yes. And it is called Less Is Now, directed by our good friend Matt Diavella. Yeah. And finally, like we got to this point. It's funny because we thought like, ah, it's going to be four months. We'll just knock this thing out real quick. Yeah. When we started back in 2017. Yes. Oh, (laughs) man. Isn't that funny how it's like, so with minimalism, we had no expectation uh huh. And it was done in like a year and a half. Yeah. And we were just like blown away. Yeah. And then yeah, this one we were like, oh, we'll just recreate that. But now we know what we're doing, so it'll be even shorter. Right. Anyway. <laughs> well, it's finally coming out January first, twenty twenty one. Start the new year off with some simplicity. Uh, the trailer will be out in December, so you can just stay tuned to social media for that. We're at the minimalists on all the platforms but um yeah th- this film it's really a, a deep dive into living with less mm-hmm. it's has our story but we also went out and interviewed about 30 different what we're calling everyday minimalists people who were yeah. profoundly affected or influenced by our first film to let go of a lot of excess stuff we I went into their homes that's my favorite part of the documentary i think yeah it's like it's not just you and i being like simplify <laughs> right, right. <laughs> you actually get to see and then yeah. people get emotional and there's people yeah. from every walk of life uh young old rich poor doesn't really matter every different ethnicity what people realize is they're overwhelmed by materialism right Mm. and if you are overwhelmed by materialism then minimalism might be the solution to that we also interviewed five different experts about different areas like community and relationships and the economy and the environment and families and uh phenomenal 
interviews in there. And then, of course, our story is in there as well, sort of as the thread that weaves this thing together. And it's a relatively short film. It's less than an hour long. We mm-hmm. we wanted to take that minimalism thing seriously. <laughs> yeah. And so uh, the weird thing is, Ryan, this is the third time that we've done this film. We mm. have two other versions that we we created that we'll never see the light of day because yeah. they weren't right. But it finally came together into this. And for the first time, when I, when I, as we went through these iterations, it was getting better and better. And I remember we got to that fifth cut of the film when we turned it into Netflix. Yeah. And I was like, oh, wow, this is even better than minimalism. Yeah. And I didn't think I was ever going to feel that as we were going through it because minimalism made me feel something so visceral and emotional. And finally, uh, Matt's a genius, obviously. Mm-hmm. We weaved it together, or he weaved it together in this way where, I don't know, it brought out all the, the heartstrings to get tugged. Yeah, he did a great job. I can't wait for it to come out. Until then, uh, we have three seasons of Living Room Conversations on our YouTube channel. If you want to get some answers for your minimalist questions, 60 different short videos there. Ryan and I in our living rooms answering your questions. You can find that at our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash the minimalist. It's right there on the main page. Just scroll down a bit. Living room conversations. And you can just skip around. You don't have to watch any particular order. You don't have to watch all 60 videos. Find the ones that resonate with you, the questions that you might be asking. We probably have already answered them in those living room conversations on our YouTube channel. You can follow The Minimalist on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at The Minimalist. Come to one of our live podcast shows. Visit theminimalists.com slash tour to find a city near you. If you have a question, comment, or minimalism tip for our podcast, email a voice memo to podcast at theminimalists.com. You can comment on this episode at youtube.com slash theminimalist. And if you want our show notes in your inbox, sign up for our email list at theminimalists.com. You'll also receive our simple Sunday emails. And if you leave here today with just one message, we hope it's this. Love people and use things because the opposite never works. Thanks for listening, y'all. We'll see you next time. Every little thing you think that you need. Every little thing you think that you need. Every little thing that's just feeding your greed. Oh, I bet that you'd be fine without it.